Hi there, welcome to Ask the Chiropractor, your source for ultimate health, healing, chiropractic, and medical related information. I'm Dr. Adam Rodnick, a chiropractor out of Commerce Township, Michigan, and I'll be your host today. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Ruven Rubenstein out of Troy, Michigan. We're here with our two special guests. We have Dr. Mark Kordowitz, orthopedic surgeon. How's it going? Nice. And Dr. Chris Mobley, doctor right. of physical therapy. Right. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us. So I just want to talk uh, first and ask you guys uh, how long you've been in practice, where you practice at, and uh, what got you into the profession. Okay. Uh, I practice at the Letterman Kordowitz Center for Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine in West Bloomfield, Michigan. I uh, came back to Michigan. I uh, was born and raised in Michigan and uh, did my medical school in Philadelphia. After uh, uh, medical school, I came back to Michigan. I did my orthopedic surgery residency. And followed by my residency, I went to Chicago, where I was at the University of Chicago and completed a one-year sports medicine fellowship. I then went into private practice in Colorado for approximately two years, saw all these sports injuries from the mountains. And then I headed to Texas, where I practiced for another two years. And I've uh, been back in Michigan with uh, Letterman Cordowitz Orthopedics for the past eight years. Awesome. We're well, glad to have yeah. you here today. And yourself, Doc? Yes, I'm actually born and raised in Georgia. I've been in Michigan for the last 15 years. I've been practicing my entire career here. I joined Dr. Cordowitz and Dr. Letterman um, about six months after Dr. K joined the um, practice. Um, and let's see, we work hand in hand together. So the physical therapy at the, um, at the center is in house. So um, I began, began my physical therapy career. Um, I was a college basketball player. And after uh, three knee surgeries and spending <laughs> a lot of time in sports medicine, Gosh. I realized that this, that was a field that I can enjoy being a part of. That's fantastic. And I know one big misconception that a lot of our patients and a lot of our audience members have is that surgeons don't work with chiropractors and chiropractors don't work with physical therapists. And that's definitely the contrary. Um, if you guys could tell us your experience, you know, working with other professions and how we can work together. Oh, uh, yeah, right. No, there's no question. One, uh, we have physical therapy you know, in-house, so we have the benefit of treating patients and then being able to see the progress of physical therapy and the communication of having uh, therapy on hand and having Chris come over to the office and say, hey, uh, Ms. So-and-so, you know, I think we can do this or do that or she's progressing well. And so there's that great uh, asset of having therapy in-house. With regards to chiropractic treatment, massage therapy, acupuncture, I see so many sports-related injuries as well as uh, weekend warriors that come into the office and it's an integral part where it's not just me as an orthopedic surgeon because we're a very conservative practice. I would say 90% of what I do can be and see is treated conservatively. So it's that multidisciplinary approach where um, I diagnose a problem and then get these people into the right hands. It being physical therapy, massage therapy, chiropractic treatment, acupuncture, whatever it is, I think people can benefit from all modalities. And we really appreciate the fact that you're coming on our show and letting the audience <clears throat> know that we can co-manage patients together, that it's not a one-stop shop. We can, you know, if you have to refer out, if, if we're worrying about getting the patient well, right. and you have to go to a chiropractor, a physical therapy, an orthopedic surgeon, if our mindset is on getting the patient well, we can co-manage them. Absolutely, I agree. It's all about whatever's good for the patient. And I feel that really communication is, is extremely important. You know, you could, you, people hear stories that some chiropractors will say, never go to a surgeon or never go for physical therapy, only see us. And some surgeons will say, never do this, only come to me. And that's not the case at all. And really, I, I think open communication is so important. As long as doctors can communicate with each other and really have the, best, the patient's best interest in mind, that's the most important thing. Yes, because the patient's outcome is actually the ultimate goal. Um, in my experience, especially with the sports medicine background, everything's about the symbiotic relationship and everybody working together. There are some things that, well, that some people can do better and more efficient at. And it's actually with this day in healthcare where the prices are astronomical and different coverages, there are things that I um, may have been trained to do, but insurance doesn't reimburse. And then there's another provider or specialist out there that can do that same thing, if not better, um, at a more optimal um, price point or actually more conducive to the patient. And it's all about what's good for the patient. Yes. And you know, we don't need to hog all the glory and say, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rodney got them better, yeah. Dr. Hordo's got them better. Mm -hmm. Whatever's good for the patient at the time and, right. and who can help them the most. And it's, it's very easy to co-manage now, especially with how easy it is to <clears> communicate <throat> with, uh, that we can email records, fax records, um, 
the technology is really great. The fact that you know we have digital X-ray in our office makes it really easy. Just hand a patient a disc, bring this out to Cordo, and have them take a look at it. Uh, a lot easier than than it was ten years ago to communicate. Right. And I think patients understand also seeing uh, myself as a, a sports medicine orthopedic surgery as well as a, a deal and a doctor of osteopathy. You know, 100 plus years ago when osteopathy was started, the whole idea was to treat the body as a whole, not mm -hmm. just a symptom area. And I think there's that overlap where osteopathy and manipulation and the whole musculoskeletal system to integrate that into the science of medicine um, has really made the difference. So. I, I value the chiropractic treatment because yep. my, my father, he was a physician, he was a DO. And I grew, that's all I grew up. I grew up mm -hmm. knowing that through that's manipulation. Uh, oh, and he did manipulation too. Uh, okay. Could, could make cool. a, a huge difference. Personally, I, I, I know that. <laughs> and that's great because yeah. that's, that's what it is. It's about making sure their, the body's functioning as a whole. Right. You're not just an arm, you're not just a leg, you're not just a head, you're one complete unit. And we need to make sure that unit's functioning 100% from top down. Mm -hmm. So if we work together and you're doing shoulders, I'm doing necks. I mean, we're all experts in what we do, and that's why co-managing is great. Yes. Would you say, you know, when someone does have an injury, it's very easy to have one joint affect the rest, too. Like you said, you know, shoulder and a neck, let's say someone falls down, you know, tears rotator cuff muscles here, but they also strain and whiplash their neck, cause some vertebrae out of alignment. How easy is it to injure more than one thing at the same time? Well, I think it happens all the time. And I think people will come in uh, for evaluation, whether they're referred or not, and say, well, I'm here for my shoulder. <laughs> and uh, they, every, you know, they want to have a very con concrete and specific diagnosis which I understand, but a lot of times there is that overlap. We say, well, you know, you do have shoulder pathology, but you also have trauma sustained to the cervical musculature, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Chris, you said you injured your leg three times. Did you notice from that injury that other body parts started to be affected? I noticed then and I continue to notice now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing, because um, as Dr. K and you all were saying, the body is one unit. So when people come in for injuries and they come for the diagnosis, but we also need to treat the why. So just because you have a back pain, it could be coming from your foot. And if you just address the back, you're only addressing a temporary symptom instead of the source and the cause of the pain. And a lot of things that we try to look for now, because with my injury, it, was, it actually came from a weakness. So um, we're trying to transition to, to um, prevention and prehab versus Absolutely. just rehab because we need to take care of things before <clears throat> they become a problem rather than let them become a problem. Yeah, and, that, and I love what you said about prevention, too. That's one mm -hmm. th big thing you know, in our office that we, we are really big on preventing further. And just, someone may come into us initially with, back pain and if we see a problem somewhere else we want to take care of it to prevent another injury in other areas so you know let's say they came in for lower back pain and we notice they do say oh I have a little bit of tenderness here and let's say we take an x-ray we see that their cervical spine is totally reversed well we want to take care of that before they have radiculopathy running down their arm before they have a big injury or bulging disc and in traditional medicine people are used to waiting till they get a symptom and then going to try to take care of that symptom so in our office also, we're trying to get people away from that. We want, if we can prevent a person from ever having to be in pain, why wait till they're in it to take care of it? Exactly. I mean, that's, what, that's the ultimate goal is to get them there. So if we can never have them there in the first place, I think preventative care is a way smarter way to look at health care. Right. Well, Chris can tell you I'm over in our therapy <laughs> probably too often. And you know, again, it's a, a prevention, and he'll say, oh, it's, it's your core, and uh, no, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but right, it's working that specific musculature and prevention to avoid being back in our offices, right? So we're speaking earlier, you run marathons. I do. You do Ironman, so yeah. I know you're, you're going to see Chris to make <clears throat> sure that you're prevented, because you're going out and running 26.2 miles, biking 112, swimming over two miles. So you want to make sure your body is in the best shape possible because things can go wrong when you're doing that many uh, activities at one time. No question. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that I've learned so much from our physical therapy department from Chris to understand uh, what I need to do, again, working the, the whole body and you know, that everything is interconnected. So when I see these fellow triathletes come into the office, I, I see, I speak from experience myself when I, I get it because everyone has this passion to go out and go, 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 and then it's, it, they don't come in until they've already, this, this problem's been lingering and yep. lingering. 
and usually it's a matter of, well, they're having the knee pain, but it's usually because of their hip or their pelvis. Uh, something is out of alignment. They have flattening of the foot where because of their, uh, uh, their flat foot, uh, they're rolling and turning their knee in, yep. causing increased contact pressures on the knee. So looking again at the whole body, at the whole, the whole system as opposed to just the problem area. And do you deal mostly with marathon runners? What do you, would you say your percentage of patients? I know you deal a lot with athletes. I do. I would say this is a time of year where they start trickling into our office uh, in two weeks, we have uh, we spring forward. Uh, I don't know if our weather will spring forward, but I sure uh, hope so. Right, uh, and so what we see are all these outside activities with the half marathons and marathons creeping up. So people are starting to pick up their mileage, and so we'll see these people coming in with these overuse injuries, but also triathlon. I, I'm part of a big triathlete group and club, and these. You know, these people are training for full Ironman distance, which is a 2.4-mile swim, a 112-mile bike ride, followed by a 26.2-mile run. And so besides the trauma and the impact that's put on the body, you also have these positional contortions of being on the bike yep. where you have a muscle imbalance. And it's so critical that, again, we all work together with chiropractic treatment, with physical therapy to get these people back out on the playing field, right? And would you say that a lot of times when the patients do come into, <clears throat> their symptoms have persisted for a while before they got it checked out? No question. So I always no. tell people, as soon as someone has a symptom, symptom is like a warning sign. It's like a check engine light in your car. As soon as that goes on, most people just keep on driving. But they, I, ideally, they should go to get their engine checked right away. And most people that do start to have symptoms just try to tough it out for a while, and right. then they can have a much bigger <coughs> injury because there already is instability, because there already is weakness, rather than getting to the cause of the problem and taking care of it right away. And I think that you know becomes uh, it just becomes more difficult for you know our job for you guys as well as Chris when we do get them into therapy and chiropractic treatment. It just it takes that much longer to get them back to where they want to be. And everyone has you know that's in these triathlons and training for these marathons. There is that percentage of type A personality that they just want to go go yep. go. And actually, I was just reading a study where it's really about. Um, the 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. that now we, there's more literature and research showing that 80% that of our training should be at a, a very small base level, that only intense high, high energy training should, should only encompass a very small but people only know to really go one speed, yep. and that's usually full force ahead. And I think that's one of the problems where you see these overuse injuries is they're going out too hard and going too much. Chris, is there a few exercises that you can give our audience or a, a regimen that you can say to maybe do and help prevent some of these injuries? Well, for um, when it comes to marathon training, um, as Dr. Um, Fortowitz was alluding to, the actual key is actually recovery time and the rest. <clears throat> um, so if you're going to start your training program, you want to have um, probably three days on, no more than four days on, definitely two days off, and, and one of the um, on or off days is a recovery day. Um, if you're doing marathon training, you want to make sure that um, on the weekend when you have more time, that's going to be your long run. Um, you want to make sure that the um, runs leading up to that weekend run don't exceed, the total mileage doesn't exceed that weekend mileage. So if you're going to run 10 miles on Sunday, the three runs that you do prior to that should not exceed 10 miles. They should be, you know... 10 miles total. It's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. yeah, so it should be 10 miles total and then <coughs> a maximum of, 10 mile, of 20 miles for the week. Okay. And then you, and you want to steadily progress that up, but um, the key prior to um, competition is making sure that you um, taper down leading up to the competition. So if, you, if you're on a 20 week program, you probably wanna max out your training around week 15 or week 16 and then, tap, and then taper down so that your body can recover so that you're actually in optimal physical condition um, leading up to the race versus still challenging your body. Now would you say you see most of the injuries in the beginning of their training process that people overdo it right off the bat? Well, from my end, it's actually more of the level of the um, trainer. So I see it more in beginners than experienced runners, right. Right. or if somebody's trying to change their um, their training regimen. Um, so sometimes people decide, okay, I want to initiate strength training. If you're if you're um, beginning your training for a marathon, that's not the time to start tra strength yeah. training. You don't want to overload your body. You want to give it a chance to recover. There is a benefit to strength training because it's going to make your running more efficient, especially if you strengthen the hips and the pelvic girdle. Um, in the core. So then you'll have a more efficient and more effective um, stride and um, more efficient run. 
That's some great advice. I mean, I know marathon runners, and I've seen that just beginners, and they're, okay, let's go get it, and they'll just go and train as hard as possible, hard as possible, and then you see these injuries start occurring because, like you said, you want to make sure you're tapering down by week 15 so your body has time to recover, and you're at the, you have the strength built up, and then by the time you have five weeks to continue, obviously, with your routine, sure. but now it's time for the show and you can actually perform. Yes. You know, with marathons and also with, with other sports in general, what are some of the common injuries that you guys do see, whether it's knees or shoulders or hips? I would say with uh, marathons, uh, knee pain uh, and hip pain, and it's usually, I would say 90% of the time, it's due to pelvic male alignment um, and in the proper running form. I think that, you know, as, as kids, we've all, we all know how to run, but do we all know how to run correctly? Yeah. You know, talking about, well, if there's just a little forward lean in our stance, that takes a huge contact stress off the patellofemoral joint, the mm-hmm. knees. So just being either analyzed in therapy or on a treadmill by someone, uh, a professional uh, runner or, or, or coach to say, you know what, if we make these changes, then it can maybe take away the problem. But usually correction of uh, pelvic malalignment and proper running form as well as shoe wear. I think a, a lot of people, Absolutely. they are so unaware of their arches, whether they over pronate or supinate mm-hmm. and getting him into a correct arch support is also a uh, uh, has been a, shown to be and a that's big one thing. thing. We have a, a clip that we'll play that in the next episode that we have. Um, we <clears> actually <throat> have some really cool technology in our office. Uh, we use a laser technology to check topography of the feet, check for the arches. We can send to a lab to build a custom orthosis for running shoes, but even uh, dress shoes, loafers, any kind of shoe particularly to make sure there's no over pronation going on. And that we definitely see helps prevent a lot of injuries and helps keep the pelvis in normal alignment as well, helps our adjustments hold better. Right. But as you said, uh, pelvic misalignment and subluxation, that's definitely something that we see a lot of injuries with, whether it's from athletes or even just from uh, overuse injuries and lifting and uh, job-related injuries, all sorts of things. So that's something that we definitely specialize in. We work on a lot of uh, pelvic subluxations, whether it's um, the sacroiliac joint where the pelvis meets the sacrum, sacrum sits kind of like a triangle, and the pelvis can tilt like this and, uh, and miss line, which can then even affect hips, knees, the down whole, the kinetic right, chain The whole kinetic well. chain, exactly. Well, I think with uh, <laughs> experience, like you say, we see a lot of uh, beginners that maybe overdo it. You know, the ones that have been running marathons for long periods of time as well as have been in triathlon for a period of time, they realize, you know, they talk about triathlon, swimming, biking, running, and then that fourth discipline is recovery. Yep. But mm-hmm. having a dynamic recovery. So not just resting and not doing anything, but part of that recovery is getting in, in, in for chiropractic treatment to make sure that everything is in alignment, Realigned. to have that massage therapy, to do specific yoga stretching modalities to optimize so when you go back to hard training, you're, you're on in, in optimal I like how you say uh, that, that it's actually the fourth, yeah, fourth, fourth part. part of it, too. That right. really makes sense. Too. I haven't had it and it's probably like the that. most important part. Right. Probably. So would you recommend for our audience, if you want to plan to go and become a marathon runner or a triathlete or run an Ironman, to get checked out prior to your training? Get checked out, go to a physical therapist, go make sure and get someone that's a professional to tell you, hey, here's how you should do it. Don't go YouTube it. Get a professional opinion of how to do it, and that will help prevent injuries. I think that's the best way to go about it. And everyone's different, and everyone has their strengths and weaknesses so if you can have a specific game plan going into a program then you're much less um, prone to, to having an injury yeah let's talk about some of the other injuries that you guys see too you know again this is very applicable with uh, triathlete training and marathon training as well but with even some of the other injuries what we see a lot of times too is the longer someone's had the injury before they seek treatment the more adhesion the more scar tissue that builds up again the longer that it takes to rehabilitate to adjust, to correct it. And what I see a lot is with um, with auto accidents. We'll see a lot of patients that had a car accident <clears throat> five, six years ago. They had symptoms, they had problems, and it progressively just got worse and worse and worse. Now they come to see us five years later with significant degenerative changes, osteoarthritis, osteophytic formation, which is bone spurs, which I, we can explain that in a minute too. We see the longer they wait, the faster it degenerates, the longer it takes to get better. So again, with that type of thing as well, we encourage and urge people to Get checked out right away. Don't wait. Don't let scar tissue form. Yes. You guys see you very similar? All the time. And sometimes you'll see it visually. You'll see that muscle atrophy. 
If you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. So people will guard, they'll have pain, and they're hoping that it will go away, and it doesn't go away, and they start holding it. So one, besides the uh, fibrotic tissue, uh, they'll develop the scar tissue for the shoulder. We see it all the time, whether it's a motor vehicle accident or from training, whether it's running or swimming. Softball, baseball. They'll develop, right, overuse, uh, overhead activities. They'll develop adhesive capsulitis, where literally adhesive frozen. capsulitis is a frozen shoulder. So it's one thing if someone can lift it to a certain point, and then I can lift that arm passively. Mm -hmm. But a frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis is when they can only they, as well as myself, can only lift it so far because that capsular tissue has so, so many adhesions. So right, the sooner people get in and get treated, the less chance that, that will happen. Because what I've experienced a lot of times too is that a lot of times we can correct an issue. So if we have a pelvic malalignment, we can cor correct the positioning, but if it's been there for a the long standing period, the person's habitually learned to go back to that faulty position. So then it's also corrected and then maintain it. So the longer that you learn the faulty position, um, the tougher it's going to be for full correction. Um, the body does a good job at trying to do things the most efficient way, not yeah. necessarily the best way. So if you have an injury and you start circumverting with your gait, um, if you do it for 20 years, it may take a while to correct that. So the earlier that you can um, get the um, symptoms addressed and the issue addressed, the, the quicker that we can actually have a full recovery versus a temporary um, a recovery. Yeah, I let my patients know all the time. They're like, oh, why do I have to come back? I go, because the bone's been out like this for years and years and years. Yes. When I push it here, mm -hmm. the muscles are trained to pull it back. Right. Yes. So not only are we removing the bones, we have to retrain the muscles, exactly. ligaments, and tendons to get back into that normal position. Mm -hmm. Because it's so used to, like you said, it's been years and years out of position, mm -hmm. and now it doesn't like that normal position. feeling. Right. Exactly. Normal feels weird. So the muscles say, I don't like that, pulls it back. So it takes time to retrain the muscles, whether under chiropractic care, physical therapy, you have to retrain the body to get into that normal position. Now, I know you mentioned um, just now with lifting your arm where they can only lift it so far. Now, if you could explain the difference between muscles and ligaments, we see that a lot. Let's say someone comes in and says, Doc, you know, it goes to here. Then, of course, I can lift it. So what does that mean to people? What's the difference between muscles and ligaments? We see a lot of times we'll see a supraspinatus tear like that. They can't right. lift it. That's why I know I need to send it to Dr. Cordova, right. that's something that, you know, it's So I, I tell people there's two things for essentially all the joints. You have muscles, which are dynamic, uh, where they have muscles that form into the tendon, and the tendon inserts into the bone. And ligaments go from bone to bone. So you can't strengthen the ligament. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are either, they have tight ligaments, or sometimes they'll be loose, where there'll be increased laxity and increased play. So sometimes the root cause of why people have play in the shoulder is one, because dynamically the muscles aren't stabilizing the joint, whether it's a knee or the hip or the shoulder, uh, as well as the ligaments are, uh, are loose. So a good example is an ankle sprain. People say, oh, I've had an ankle sprain, and then they come back in, um, and they don't get any treatment for it, and then they have a recurrent ankle sprain, and then again and again, where by the time they come in to see me, hmm. there's so much play in that ankle that no matter what we do with physical therapy, it's not going to stabilize that joint enough because those ligaments are stretched out and they require surgery. So a perfect example is even an ankle sprain, a simple ankle sprain, we get people into therapy right away to work on di the dynamic muscles around that ankle but with all the different modalities that Chris provides. You know, you can take something uh, that may be a severe initial ankle sprain, but if you treat them correctly, then the chance of them having a recurrent sprain will no longer be there. So again, getting the right treatment right away instead of trying to deal with problems on your own. And I'm sure you notice with your patients, if someone sprains their right ankle, the next time it's always that right ankle. And it's always <clears> that <throat> recurring. You never see someone that, oh, I sprained my right ankle, and the next time, oh, I sprained the leg. Which one is it? It's never the left one the second time. It's that a reoccurring because they don't think about it. They think, oh, let's tighten my shoelaces right. and get back on the court. Is that, you, you agree? You exactly. play basketball. One of the things that we found out about ankles is that um, re-injury is actually exp exponential versus um, interval. So if, if you injure the first time, the next time it's going to be two times more likely, two times more severe. Yeah. The, the third time is going to be four times more likely, four times more severe. Um, and a lot of times people only want to treat the symptoms. With the ankles, you want to make sure that you actually address the, the strength and the proprioception as well, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you can protect it yourself. So just getting rid of the pain, getting rid of the swelling isn't enough for an injury like an ankle sprain. Now, Dr. Mobley, uh, if someone does have repetitive ankle injuries, are they then more likely to have a knee injury, perhaps? 
because they're walking with ligament laxity in their ankles, are they more likely to injure another joint above the connective chain as well? Yes. Um, with any injury, you're actually going to be more likely to address um, uh, an, another joint because there's going to be compensatory actions taken by the other joints. So if you have an ankle sprain and um, you're actually un unstable, you may have either more um, pronation or supination, which is going to either internally or externally rotate your um, your tibia and femur, which is going to put extra stresses on your knees and the hips. So um, if you do have an injury to one spot and, if, and it isn't addressed correctly, you're going to be more likely to re-injure another spot. A location in the body. So we've talked about the injuries. Now let's talk about, let's say, IK, I did injure myself. <clears throat> Go over the procedures of how we figure out what percentage of your patients are getting better with conservative care, what kind of percentage of patients are going to actually need the surgery. Um, like I said before, that the majority of patients can be treated conservatively. Um, with different modalities. And we have a very conservative office between myself and Dr. Letterman, as well as our physical therapy department. There are so many modalities. And again, we believe in a multidisciplinary approach where it's not just us, but again, opening to chiropractic treatment, whatever is going to provide the right care to get people back on the playing field. So uh, we will have patients come into our office on a regular weekly basis mm -hmm. for a second opinion. Yeah. And they'll say, my surgeon said that I need surgery. <laughs> and we'll look at them and you know, we'll, we'll examine them, we'll look at their x-rays or MRI, whatever available, and there's a good amount of time where that conservative treatment was not even discussed. Yep. Yeah. So and We know that's a big misconception, a horror story that people have to even <clears throat> go for a surgery consultation is that they think the second they sign in the paperwork, they're on the operating table, and that's not the case. You said the majority of your cases in the office are conservative, where you Absolutely. don't have to, to But cut. From, a, uh, from a physical exam, uh, I can usually diagnose the problem mm -hmm. and say whether something is going to likely need surgery or not. Um, so it, it, it really depends on the joint, the problem, the injury at the time. And that's great for our audience to hear that you can go to an orthopedic surgeon and you may not get cut open because yeah. I know a lot of people, they're scared. Like Dr. Rodnick said, they're scared for the consultation because they think you walk through that door, door, the knife's coming out. Right. And we hear right here that that's not the case. You can go for, a sec go for a second opinion. If the first person scared you, go somewhere else and yeah. see if we can do it conservatively. Yeah. People get three quotes for the roof, <clears throat> they get one quote exactly. for their right. spine, you know. Right. And they, and and one of the things I enjoy about working with Dr. Letterman and Dr. Quarterwitz is that I can say that I probably get about 75 or 80 percent of the pre-surgical people just to give it a shot beforehand. Now, we had a patient a couple of weeks ago who injured himself um, beginning a running program and his MRI was actually indica ind indicative of having surgery mm -hmm. but he, we were able to treat him um, conservatively and um, did a lot of proprioceptive and strength training and he's probably going to still have the surgery but now he can do it on his time. Yeah. You know? right, right. And he feels well, that he can do everything that he wants to do now, but the tear is bad enough that, you know, over time it may be an issue. That's fantastic. Well, that's all the time we have for, for today's episode. I want to thank you both for joining us. Again, this is Dr. Chris Mobley, uh, Doctor of Physical Therapy, Dr. Mark Kordowitz, orthopedic surgeon, and I'm Dr. Adam Rodnick, your host for Ask the Chiropractor. And I'm Dr. Ruven Rubensen, your co-host. And we will see you guys next time on Ask the Chiropractor.